Ronstadt grew up in Tucson, Arizona and moved to LA at just 18 years old. And we're going to visit some of the haunts and homes here, some secret, some not so secret, that shaped her into being one of the most popular and beloved artists of all time. So the first place Linda moved here in Los Angeles was in this funky uh, beach area right here called Ocean Park in Santa Monica. It used to be funky. It's gentrified quite a bit. And I would venture to guess these homes are all multi-million dollar homes. But she moved into this bungalow right here uh, with a guitarist she knew from Tucson named Bobby Kimmel and another guitarist named Kenny Edwards. Anyways, they lived right here. You perhaps remember that picture of the uh, Stone Ponies, the back cover all sitting right here but there's an interesting story about the band that happened in their days here as most musicians they were very poor even though they would put out a couple albums they had one barely running jalopy between them and anyways one day they had to uh, drive into Capitol Records in Hollywood for a meeting and on the way there uh, the engine on the car seized uh, they nursed it into a gas station and as they waited in the gas station where the attendant told them that the car was basically scrapped for the very first time they heard the strains of a different drum coming through am radio in the gas station what's ironic about it it was the absolute apex moment for the band hearing their song for the first time on the radio like that and uh, just a couple hours later when they finally did make their meeting with uh, capital it was one of their lowest, because Capitol informed them that the next album would be called Linda Ronstadt, Stone Ponies and Friends. You know, it was more or less the end of the band, but it was one of those, uh, we love what you're doing, don't change a thing moment, you're fired. So, anyways, here was the house right here. This tiny rural hilly town that connects the San Fernando Valley to Malibu and the ocean called Topanga. This is where Linda lived circa 1969, and even today it exudes an earthy, pseudo-hippie vibe. Although outwardly beautiful and bucolic, because of the proliferation of some weird late 60s communes there, Linda recalls Topanga Canyon at the time as having a funky, dark undertone, and she even recalls seeing the Charles Manson family girls hanging around and hitchhiking through the canyon. Here on Old Topanga Road, her next door neighbor was Gary Hinman. And in April of 1969, Hinman was the first victim of the Manson family murders. Luckily, when it happened, Linda was away playing in New York, but it freaked her out so badly that she stayed with friends a couple weeks before returning. All right, I don't know if you could see this because it's on private property over there, but that's the house uh, that was the cover of Linda's album, a hand-sewn homegrown. It was also the cover of the Notorious Bird Brothers by the Birds. I mean, it's a pretty famous house, but it's been built up and I and, you know, can't get to it, unfortunately. You know, Bernie Ledden from the Flying Burrito Brothers and later the Eagles, he lived up here too, and he and Linda did a lot of jamming. And they loved to play Merle Haggard songs, George Jones songs. And I would have to say that uh, Topanga Canyon here was probably genuinely one of the birthplaces of country rock. They did. So uh, now we're in the kind of heart of Hollywood, and although there's been a lot of gentrification around here, uh, the neighborhood we're in is pretty sketchy. Uh, we're on the corner of Ivar and Selma. And uh, we're here because this is where Linda cut one of her biggest records ever. Actually, the record that launched her into superstardom. Uh, called Heart Like a Wheel. And it was right here at the Sound Factory. She did it with uh, Peter Asher, her producer manager. The song had been covered before by Betty Everett. I think she did it in 63. Dee Dee Warwick, Dionne Warwick's sister, had a hit with it, and so did the Swingin' Blue Jeans, I think, in England. But anyways, there's kind of a cool little story about uh, Andrew Gold's uh, uber catchy guitar solo in You're No Good. They had spent hours and hours and hours getting the solo just right, getting that sound. And Linda decided to go out for dinner and meet her boyfriend. And she was very excited about the song and she wanted him to, uh, she wanted him to come back and hear it. So he comes back, they roll the tape for him and after it goes by, he goes, uh, it's very good, but why all of a sudden does it turn into a Beatles song in the guitar solo? And this kind of struck a raw nerve with Peter Asher, who of course had something to do with the Beatles with Peter Gordon. So they spent the next day and a half trying to change the solo into something it wasn't. And eventually they went back to the iconic solo, the, the original Beatles solo that we all know and love. 
But uh, what I think was interesting uh, is the person that made that comment was none other than our very favorite Albert Brooks. And uh, if you know anything about Albert Brooks, it just makes so much sense that he did that. But anyways, Linda recalls her vocal performance being one of the live guide vocal takes as the song was being tracked. And I mention that because of what happened years later when Heart Like a Wheel was chosen to be among the Library of Congress's 400 most important titles of the 20th century. Uh, when Linda learned of this, she said, uh, you know, had I known that was going to happen, I would have sung it better. But anyway, the Sound Factory Hollywood. It almost seems like wherever Linda went, there were satellites of uber-talented people orbiting her. And that included, at one time or another, all the members of the original Eagles, Warren Zevon, Graham Parsons, the list goes on. Which brings us here, right behind the Hollywood Bowl in the Hollywood Heights section of LA at the historic Highland Camrose Bungalows. So circa 1970, Linda Ronstadt lived here with her then boyfriend, J.D. Souther. And it was kind of a communal place that scenesters would gather uh, in these bungalows, like-minded people. Uh, Jackson Brown had one of the other bungalows here. The very earliest incarnations of the Eagles actually rehearsed at J.D. and Linda's bungalow here. I actually had a friend that lived here in the later 70s in one of the bungalows, and I spent more than a few nights here hanging out. It still had kind of that communal hippie vibe. I wish I could remember more of it, but uh, I can if you know what I mean. But uh, what I do remember is that the houses were very dilapidated then, and everything smelled of wet, rotting wood. But this place, I think, was one of the cradles of the Southern California country rock movement outside of the Troubadour. A lot of it started right here. Cameras. Just below the Hollywood sign in the foothills is this cool little section of Hollywood called Beachwood Canyon. And probably only second to Laurel Canyon as a place in the early 70s for musicians to live and gather. This is where Linda lived with John David Souther after she moved out of their place on Camrose. They lived in the upstairs unit and the previous tenant had been friend and fellow songwriter Warren Zevon with whom Linda would cross paths again when uh, she covered his classic song, Poor, Poor, Pitiful Me. The rear unit over the garage was occupied by Harry Dean Stanton, whose signature still resides here, but he was an up-and-coming actor at the time and also an accomplished musician. He and Linda shared a love for traditional Mexican music, and Linda said she was inspired to return to her roots by listening to Harry's late-night crooning here. Linda remembers leading somewhat of a quiet life here, although she spent most of her time on the road during these days. So, you know, Linda considered herself a ballad singer, um, and she said she included some up-tempo numbers in her set just to keep people from falling asleep. I think she underestimated herself. I, I think she has one of the most powerful voices in rock. And uh, I think she proved it on, like, Tumbling Dice. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever sang it better with the possibility of Jagger. And the same thing goes for Back in the USA, you know, the Chuck Berry song. Now, we're in Laurel Canyon here on Wonderland Avenue. And uh, back in the 70s, this is where Jerry Brown's house was. Uh, this was uh, when he wasn't in Sacramento being the governor. He had a place here in L.A. So, obviously, uh, Linda uh, hung out here a lot. And uh, just a few houses down from here is the infamous uh, four on the floor murder house. Uh, you know, the murders that took place in 1980 that involved uh, John Holmes. You know, of course, Hollywood didn't wait uh, very long to, uh, uh, to do a movie about it, but it actually occurred right here, right here, this place. I don't know, is it me or just... Weird stuff kind of follow Linda around. I think it's me. Anyways, onward. With the money she had started bringing in with the release of Heart Like a Wheel, Linda decided it was time to move somewhere more substantial and chose Malibu. Uh, this section of beach is known as the Colony and is among the most expensive real estate in all America but it was the perfect place for a burgeoning young star to hang her hat and recharge after the endless strength tour she performed. All right, so here we are. This was uh, Linda's place. It was the first place she actually bought 
And uh, she said the thing she was most excited about living here uh, was actually that she could have her own washing machine. She'd never had one before. She had to go to laundromats uh, when she brought her laundry home from the road. And uh, it was something that she really uh, felt she deserved. Uh, she also got herself a big old piano here. And this kind of became the de facto Troubadour West, if you will. You know, uh, Neil Young, Jackson Brown, Nicolette Larson, Emmylou Harris, they all hung out here and jammed. And it was also the place that Jerry Brown spent a lot of time at. As you can see, uh, this is a very secluded, very exclusive uh, section of beach. And, uh, you know, it, it enabled them to walk their dogs, to jog, all that kind of stuff. It used to be more exclusive. They used to have uh, no trespassing signs. And in California, that's a no-no. The beach belongs to everybody. But uh, anyways, right here, Malibu Colony Road. So right after leaving Malibu, Linda moved here to the Brentwood section of Los Angeles, right here on Rockingham Avenue. And if Rockingham sounds familiar, it should be. This was the site of O.J. Simpson's house. Uh, O.J. was basically her neighbor. And in kind of a, uh, you know, macabre little twist, uh, Linda used to often walk her dog with Nicole Brown Simpson. You gotta wonder if they gossiped about O.J. at all. <laughs> So anyways, this is the house that uh, Linda settled in. Uh, it's kind of right out of Better Homes and Gardens. Um, it was designed by uh, Paul Williams in the 30s, I believe, and was occupied uh, for at least some of the time by actress Zazu Pitts. But um, there's a story that happened here that I think illustrates how down to earth Linda was. And keep in mind, uh, this was one of the biggest singing stars on the planet at the time. She was looking for an opening act to tour with and she went down to the comedy store in Los Angeles and caught some of the comedians. There was an act she saw that night that she loved and uh, she asked the young man if he would uh, open for her. And he said, no, but if you want to go out, I'd love to. And they did. They went on a date and it was Jim Carrey. And at the time, Jim Carrey was just starting out. He still lived with his parents here in L.A. And he drove an old, crusty Chevy Bel Air he'd brought down from Canada. And uh, when he would pick Linda up here for dates, uh, the, the passenger door would not open. He'd have to roll down the window for her and she'd crawl in. And uh, I just think that really illustrates a lot about uh, who she was as a person. And you know, uh, Jim has gone on to say that she was really an incredible person. And I think you pretty much hear that from any of her exes who ever did. Right here. You know, I've heard it said that people love Linda for her looks, but they stayed because of her voice. And I think that she was singularly brave. She took on every genre there was. I mean, rock, country, even Broadway. And I think she did all this in a time where it wasn't common for a woman to dictate what happened in her own career. Linda once also said that the essence of her voice is musicianship and story. And I would hope that in some very small way, uh, we've added to that story for you. But anyways, if you haven't done it already, I would shamelessly right now ask for your subscription to the channel. I'd just like to thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Linda for bringing us all this great music. And I just want to end by saying, keep playing it and keep playing it loud. All right, peace out. Bye-bye.